In the meantime, a study says most Americans couldn't place Iran on a map. The United States has a long and complicated history with that country, dating back to before the Ayatollahs came to power in the 1979 Islamic Revolution. Ervan Abrahamian is an Iranian-Armenian author, historian, and university professor, whose book, The Coup, is his latest work, Unpacking U.S.-Iranian Relations. Our Walter Isaacson sat down with him to discuss the events that contributed to the distrust and hostility between these two nations. Let's set this into historical context and begin in 1951 when Iran nationalizes its oil industry. How does that set a context for what's happening? It's, it's a very important background context because uh, for Iran, the nationalization of oil in 51 was the same as other colonial powers getting the colonial states getting their independence from the former colonial ruler. Mm -hmm. So it was a way of declaration of independence from Britain to take over the, ma the main natural resource Iran had, which was oil. It was, in fact, equivalent to Indian independence, Ghana independence, Indonesian independence. They even lower the oil company's yes. flag and raise yes. the Iranian flag as if it were a transfer of colonial power. It was, and it was seen that way both in Iran and Britain. Yeah. So if you look at the British press at that time, especially the newspapers like the Daily Telegraph, conservative papers, they saw this as another sort of blow against the British Empire uh, to try to balance that off, actually, that when the flag was lowered and the Iranian flag was raised, the RAF uh, flew jets of planes over Abadan in a way to say we still have the, basically, the military power. But then Britain and the United States, CIA, MI6, yeah. in 1953, foment a coup in order to reverse this decision. Was that about oil, or was that about uh, decolonization? The very historical question is really, why was the U.S. interested in helping a, a coup? Uh, and I think what the argument really was uh, at that time, that if Iran succeeds in nationalizing the oil industry, even though it's a British oil industry, this will start a bad example and other countries where American oil in, uh, interests were, like uh, mm. Venezuela, uh, Indonesia, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, that those countries would try to basically take, follow the example of Iran. And you would get a swift, basically, a, a snowballing effect of nationalization of oil. And that would really weaken American interests. So it was basically the, the, the fear of a bad example do, leading to what were the repercussions. Of course, eventually in the 70s, 1970s, uh, oil was nationalized throughout most of these countries. But in 1951, it was seen by the, both the State Department and the American oil companies that basically would, would be the end of Western civilization as we knew it. The sky would fall if these native uh, countries basically took over their oil. So we put, meaning the United States and the West, the Shah, the Shah of Iran, mm -hmm. into power after that coup in 53, or back into power as a real ruler of the nation. And he becomes a linchpin of Western security in the region. How long did that last? It, it lasted basically from 53 to 79. And superficially, it looked very stable. Here we had a monarch claimed 2,500-year history of monarchy. He had a huge army, huge military forces, a huge bureaucracy. And of course, after the oil boom of 73, unlimited oil resources. So. On the surface, it looked like a very stable, formidable ally. That's why Nixon basically appointed him American a policeman of the region. But, but it doesn't work. I mean, in this 1979, there's suddenly a huge revolution, which most people don't predict, right? Well, that's the problem. On, 
on surface, because it seemed so formidable, mm. it looked like it was going to last even in 1978. The CIA's estimate was mm. that, you know, this, there would be no problems in Iran until the oil runs out. The problem with their analysis was that they didn't really understand that the 53 coup had really delegitimized the monarchy. Do you actually believe that people in Iran in the 70s felt that the Shah was illegitimate? Yes. Because of something that happened in 53? Yes. I mean, people, the memory of 53 was very formidable. I mean, it was the main, main event that had occurred in Iranian history, basically, mm -hmm. in their memory. And they knew, I mean, everyone basically knew <laughs> that this uh, regime was installed by the British and the Americans in 53. So it was, but, but more than that, it was installed uh, by overthrowing Mossad there, who was seen as the emblem of na national aspiration. He was the prime minister. Yeah. Of well, so it, it would be like in, in, uh, in let's say, in um, India, Nehru and Gandhi were overthrown and some uh, British supporter came to power. It, it wouldn't have legitimacy of an independent state. What was life like uh, in the 70s under the Shah? For the middle class, upper class, it was actually quite good because the, with the oil boom, um, there was a considerable amount of economic prosperity or at the higher levels. But on the general public, um, there was still uh, deprivation. Uh, there was lack of schooling, lack of universities, lack of medical care. Um, those issues really then aggravated uh, class dif differences between the better off and less off. And so the revolution became then very much a, a, also an uprising of the poor against the regime. Well, you know, the revolution, the way you describe it in your book, is also a uprising that's populist, that's religious, that's somewhat paranoid, very fervent, almost alt-right. It seems like it's part of a whole global populist rebellion. The best way to define it, some people called it, you know, fundamentalist. So there was religion, but the way the clerics reinterpreted Islam was a very, very new way that really made it into a right-wing populist movement. So they tapped into things such as nationalism, anti-imperialism, uh, the, uh, the what they call the mustasafin, which is the, the downtrodden, the, the wretched of the earth, the poor, that the state should represent them. So if you look at their re rhetoric, mm -hmm. it's actually, it sounds very radical. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, they were trying to compete and outdo the left on uh, basically social radicalism. And they end up defeating the left, because you have the Mujahideen, which is somewhat of a left-wing, right, yes. uh, anti-Shah party, yeah. and then you have the clerics, the mullahs, yeah. and they, the mullahs and clerics, end up taking over this revolution. How did that happen? Well, I think the clerics, are in some ways, had much more social support. The, the Mujahideen had a lot of support in the high schools and university, but uh, the clerics, uh, with their rhetoric appealed to the poor, especially uh, ur urban poor or recent arrivals from the villages. They had the mosques, which is an informal network that existed, and there's no way the secret police on the Sava could have really disbanded the mosques. But also there's a fact that they, although the language was uh, rhetoric rhetorically very radical, uh, Khomeini and his ideology very much had roots in the uh, petty bourgeoisie, the middle class of the bazaar. So these are very, uh, you can say, traditional uh, shopkeepers, merchants, small entrepreneurs that are located in the bazaar. They have very close networks and they have very strong ethics about Islam and social justice. And he the, the, and Khomeini's basically theology appealed to that base, and they had a great deal of money actually, so they were able to finance the revolution. And Savak, the secret police under the Shah, to what extent did that cause resentment that eventually exploded? 
obviously the oppression created resentment. Uh, uh, it, it was a period, actually, in the 70s, there's a lot of literature you could just couldn't read. If you went to a secret bookstore, usually the joke was, well, if you quote with this book, that'll get you five years. <laughs> if you get this book, 10 years. So it was basically the bookstores could tell you how many years you would get for uh, possessing various books. So the oppression was there. But again, uh, oppression is not really enough to explain a revolution. Uh, we can see nowadays many countries become more oppressive, but that doesn't mean that there's more discontent. But it was more than just oppression. I mean, there was torture, there was fighting back. Yes, uh, there was, I mean, especially in this period when they started using the tactics of uh, torture to get confessions for public arena, not confessions for information, but to force people to go on television and basically uh, 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 confessed that they had made mistakes. They had now seen the light in prison. They had read books and now seen how great the Shah was and so on. Uh, that actually further alienated, I think, the, especially the intelligentsia from the regime. How important was the Shah to America's foreign policy, and why did the U.S. insist on trying to keep him? It, it mainly is due to the Nixon doctrine. After Vietnam, Nixon had the notion that basically the U.S. was overstretched and needed to uh, outsource its basically uh, power. And the obvious, from Nixon's point of view, the obvious person to outsource it was the Shah in the Gulf. So especially when Britain decided to move out of east of Suez. The Shah then quickly said, you know, I will be the person. Uh, but part of that deal was that you, the U.S. basically sold the Shah whatever weapons they wanted, uh, even though a lot of people in the Pentagon State Department said this was not a good idea. But there was an ongoing debate. In this debate, I, I would say the business community sided with the Shah. Uh, give him whatever he wants. Um, so th th another aspect of the, I think, the, the business community supporting the Shah was that you don't interfere or meddle too much in ir Iranian politics. You don't talk to opposition figures. Um, you basically write reports that everything is fine. Uh, the Shah knows what he's doing. Uh, you, don't, you don't even check into internal politics to see what's going on. So when the revolution started, uh, the U.S. Embassy and the CIA were really taken short because they really didn't know who was who. Uh, for years, they had been told not to <laughs> talk to people. You were in exile, I know, when the Ayatollah Khomeini returns to Iran. But describe to me what that was like in Iran and what that meant. Khomeini by then was like a charismatic figure. Hmm. Uh, well, I, I don't think it was his person. It's the situation that created the charisma. But when he returned, it literally millions, I think something like this estimated three million people came into the streets to greet him. It was really basically an outpouring. And it was like a, a messiah returning. Why? Uh, because he was seen as the symbol of a revolution, the person who was going to bring a, a new Iran, independent Iran. Um, uh, that also he was authentic. Uh, he all spoke basically in Persian. He was, I mean, very literate, but he also often spoke in Persian that the average person could uh, relate to. Uh, he had basically lived a simple life, so he wasn't identified with the rich and so on. And, of course, the rhetoric I talked about of populist rhetoric very much appealed to the average person. So he was seen as a basically uh, a superhuman person who had come to save the country. When the embassy gets taken over by the students originally, this is the beginning of the revolution. What were the options then that could have saved this from becoming as bad as it did? 
when the students took over, they thought it was a sort of a temporary act to mm. stop the Americans carrying out the 53 coup again. So they didn't think in long terms. But what uh, Khomeini did as a very sort of Machiavellian politician, he used this for his own interests, which was to get a clerical constitution through. Khomeini's disciples in the Constituents' Assembly really revamped the document and brought in a great deal of clerical influence so that uh, you could still have the sort of the markings of a democratic republic, but an umbrella organizations which are clerical to supervise everything. And if he'd gone, to, if it, it, there was a choice to the public of a rep republic or a clerical republic, there was a good chance that the public would have accepted a republic. In other words, not had an Islamic republic with clerical oversight. Yeah. So how did we end up getting one of those? Well, the hostage crisis helped that. Uh, I see. In, the, in the height of the hostage crisis, the, the Khomeini dragged it out. There was always then the image the U.S. is going to attack, the U.S. is the uh, imminent enemy. There was an attempt, of course, to rescue the hostages. In that context, then they took the document to the public and said, are you going to vote for this constitution or if you voted against it, it was like going against the country supporting the United States. So that even the people who had written the original constitution, Bazar Ghan, ended up having to vote for the clerical constitution because they didn't want to be labeled as pro-American. There's some lessons for today, of course, which is that if we give an excuse to demonize the United States, yes. the hardliners take that and run with it. That's what happens in 79. It's what's happening today. It it's actually will happen very much next month because Iran is about to have uh, parliamentary elections in February. And I'm sure this, they will use this issue, the right-wing populists, to appeal to the public that, you know, the country is still in mortal danger. You have to vote for tough guys, and they might uh, very well sweep the parliamentary elections. Then you're going to have a government that's much more hard-lined than the present uh, Rouhani government. Professor, thank you so much. For thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks.